as I said, we're going to begin a, a new short preaching series. It's called Kentwood Distinctives. It's a break from a specific book of the Bible, which is our regular practice here, but it will only be for a short time. So now the question is, what is a distinctive? When we say, what is a distinctive? Is it something, uh, it's something that we as a church are convicted by from Scripture that translate into spiritual practice and that may make us distinct as a body compared to maybe some other churches. And so you, if you attend any church for a time, you start to see some of those, those distinctive things that stick out in the congregation or in that church. They stand out perhaps as unique or are part of the church's distinct flavor, and they are hopefully grounded in sound biblical truth. <laughs> That's what they should be. And so because, because there are many faces, new faces here at Kentwood, and because we're always needing to be reminded about why we do what we do as a church so as not to fall into empty ritual or create idols, we want to highlight in this series some of Kentwood's distinctives so that we may find unity in shared conviction. And more than that, we want to glorify God in all we do. And we want to be on guard, I think, from false teaching as well. So in this series, we're going to highlight four distinctives for the next four weeks. And that is, first of all, expository preaching. Second, plurality of elders. Third, complementarian. That's the, that's the one that'll be more controversial than the rest. And weekly communion. And so why do we do those things? Why are those part of our body? Why do we function that way? And so we start with the first distinctive today, which is expository preaching. Many folks who come to this church and have stayed have done so because they have recognized perhaps a unique form of preaching. It is a consistent comment we hear from a lot of the newcomers and at the newcomers meeting that the preaching has been a major factor in their attendance here. It's different. And when I ask them what they find unique about it, the response is that the word of God is being preached. That sounds basic, doesn't it? That should be basic. That we're pulling from the text what it is saying and looking for the spiritual meat that God has put in there. And so that comment is usually followed by, not many churches are doing that, and that makes me sad every time I hear that said. There is today a tendency to see sermons become story time of the preacher's life or human philosophy on display, great attempts at being catchy and attractive at the expense of sound Bible teaching. Preaching can be weekly attempts at getting to itching ears. And that is not what preaching is supposed to be. Preaching is not about some guy's opinion. Preaching is not a motivational speech. Preaching is also not just a running commentary of the Bible either, for that matter. And it is not just a series of topics on people's felt needs, because sometimes, as fallen sinners, we don't realize what we need until God tells us what we need to hear there are so many times as we preach through the word, you might be thinking, why are we going through Genesis? But then it goes, we go, oh, that day something struck me. I, I needed to hear that today. God knows that. God knows what we need to hear when we need to hear it. So then, what is preaching? Why do we preach at a church? Why do you come here Sunday after Sunday as the body of Christ and listen to people preach, to a guy preach? Those are the questions we have to ask. And are we doing it the way we're supposed to? So let's start with that first question. Number one, why preach? Preaching is simply this, the proclamation of God's word. That's the most basic understanding of preaching. It's the proclamation of God's word. It is the declaring of God's truth and calling of the hearer to God's voice to respond. It is similar to what we would call the town crier. You know, back in the old days, the town crier, he'd be sent out by the king, and he'd go out into the town and he'd cry out the word of the king. This is what the king says. And he'd cry that out with his word in hand, and he is to proclaim what the king has said and what he has commanded. It is a sacred duty for the crier, the proclaimer, to accurately declare what the king has said. That is a sacred duty. It is really a cousin of biblical prophecy, just as the prophet was to take what God has said and declare it to the people, so does the preacher take the word of God and proclaim it to the people. And this is not man's idea. It's not created by some religious zealot of the past preaching. It's God's idea. Peter was commanded to feed Christ's sheep. 
Jesus himself preached. And Jesus gave to the church people to carry on the work of teaching and preaching. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, we see a picture of that. We're told this. So Christ himself, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So God has given not just gifts to the church. He's given office. He's given offices, apostles, evangelists, uh, pastors, teachers, to build up the body of Christ. And so preaching and teaching is meant to build up the believer. It's meant to strengthen us. I don't know how many times, if you, if you are away from church for a long time, our strength f- starts to wane as we go out into the world. Every time we come back and on a regular basis, I think this is why God says don't forsake the gathering because every time we come back, we're encouraged and strengthened and built up by the word of God so that as we go out into the world, as people who wrestle with our fallen nature and wrestle with worldliness, we are strengthened for that battle. So God has given us gifts and teachers in order to do that, to strengthen them in Christ, to mature them in their faith, to cause us to stand firm in the day of darkness and to deepen our love for God and our worship of Him. It also has another purpose, to evangelize. To evangelize. We preach to evangelize. Romans 10, 14 says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? We're called to preach to this generation, to this world so that they can know Christ and his salvation. So we see that preaching is first in the church for the building up of the body of Christ, and also it is for those who are going to out to save the lost, to call them to believe in Christ and repentance. And as a side note, there's always a question that Christians argue about, and that is, what about all those people in the world who never heard the gospel? What about all those people who never got a chance to hear the gospel? Are they going to die in their sins? Are they going to go and perish? The answer is this. Scripture plainly tells it. How will they know unless some of us go? How are they going to hear and believe in Christ unless we go and tell them? And this passage so clearly tells us we need to go. There's an imperative. Go. Get out there and tell them. They won't hear otherwise. And yes, they will perish. So why do we need to send out missionaries? Why do we need to go into the world and preach? Because people will perish. There is not some backdoor way. It's only through Christ. And so the imperative is go. Get out there. So preaching builds up the body. It evangelizes the lost. It is the proclamation of God's word. So now what is expository preaching? What is expository preaching specifically There are different forms of preaching. There's topical, where someone picks a topic and they kind of run with it. We're doing that today. This is the topic of expository preaching. That's okay to do once in a while. We're going to do a little bit bit of that this summer. There's also first-person preaching, where someone actually takes the form of the person in the Bible who's talking and they preach as like an actor. I've seen that before. There's different kinds. And then there's the old, I just made this up sermon. Those happen too sometimes. But what specifically is expository preaching Sermons. What specifically is that? Well, I want to give you a couple definitions from a couple guys who are good theologians. J.I. Packer, the great theologian and pastor and writer, says this, A sermon is the proclamation of the Word of God only if the text of the Word is accurately expounded and preached. So in the strictest sense of the term, authentic preaching is expository preaching. David Helm, who is the chairman of a ministry called Simeon Trust, he says this, expositional preaching is empowered preaching that rightfully submits the shape and the emphasis of the sermon to the shape and emphasis of the biblical text. Okay, so we go into the text and we go, what is it saying? What is it telling us? What is God saying to us? Not what I want it to say, think it should say. What is it saying? The shape, the form, it all has to come down to what it says. 
So what that means is that when a person preaches a truly expository sermon, their purpose is to preach what the scripture text says, what it means in its context, and what it intended to communicate to its audience then and now. Your points as a pastor or as a preacher need to come from its points as a passage in its original intent. And that might sound easy, but it's really not easy. We have to be so careful not to take the text out of context, not to twist its meaning, not to add to it our own thoughts. Those are all things, those are dangers, and that's why I don't like preaching this way. I personally struggle with, with topical sermons because I'd rather grab a text, get in, see what it says, and bring that out. I don't want to sit here and try to take the Bible and see if it fits with the topic. That's, that's my own bent because it's a, it's a danger. I don't want to mishandle God's Word. For the preacher, expository preaching is incredibly hard work of exposing what the text says, delivering it to you as unpolluted as possible, so that the voice of God may come through accurately to its hearers. And it's a serious job, one that is sacred, one that if mishandled, really leads to false teaching. False teaching leads to spiritual sickness and spiritual death. We have to take this as a sacred duty. So every week, we as a church, we come to a text usually uh, the next one in the book we are studying. And we try to keep the flow of the context in view. And we say, God, what is it that you have said here? Why have you given us this passage and how does it apply? God knows what we need to hear in any culture, in any time, in any place. His eternal truths speak to the soul of every man, woman, and child. These truths of Scripture speak to the fallen person and our common struggles. Every tribe, nation, and tongue will be able to hear from Scripture and be impacted. And God, through expository preaching, is thus given full authority to preach to us week after week. And we could say, if faithfully done, thus saith the Lord. You know, it is something Calvin put it. He said this, I've never once shaken at the thought of Satan. But he says, I shake every time I step into the pulpit. It's a sacred duty to proclaim the Word of God. So then, is expository preaching biblical? Should it really be our main diet as a church to preach in an expository manner? Well, let's first look at our examples from Scripture, our point one for this morning. The early church example. This is the first point. Our early church example. Do we see expository preaching in Scripture? Yes, we do. In the early church, we see it described regularly. Starting with Jesus himself, Jesus, when he taught and preached, he pulled much of what he said from the scriptures at the time. The Old Testament, he pulled from those. In fact, Jesus quoted the Old Testament more than anybody else in the New Testament, and he based his messages and what he was saying on that. Saying things like, you have heard it said, or it is written. So much so that when he gave a new command, he had to say it. I give you a new command now. The point is that Jesus preached the word. In Acts chapter 8, 4, we read this about the scattered, persecuted church following uh, Stephen's martyrdom. He said, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Emphasis on preached the word. Acts 13, 44, we read, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord preached. The word of the Lord. What did they come to hear? The word of the Lord. Not the preacher's opinion or a cool story that was inspiring that week. They came to hear the word of God. Even in the Old Testament, we have the example of Nehemiah 8.8. 8. After the exile, they come back, they're rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, and they found the law of God again, this lost word of God. They found it, and it says they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear, giving the meaning, so that the people understood what was being read. So the whole town was there. They read it. They taught it. They made it plain so they understood the meaning, and they showed them what was being read. The overwhelming pattern of preaching in the Bible as our example is people coming to hear the Word of God. And folks, the Bible is the completed, inerrant, God-given Word of the Lord. It is the Bible that we are to preach 
accurately, faithfully, according to what God wanted to communicate to His church. There are some who have said, well, the Bible has multiple meanings. Actually, no, that's not true. That's not the proper hermeneutic. That's not the proper way to study your Bible. There was an intended meaning when God breathed that out. And that brings us to the next point. Why do we preach the Word? Because it's breathed out by God. And so for that, I want us to look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. This is our second point. God breathed. This is what God says about His own Word in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. First, we see all. The word all Scripture is God-breathed. Yes, all. All, meaning even the numbers in the book of Numbers, is breathed out by God and has a purpose in our Bibles. Even those boring uh, lists of names that you read is breathed out by God. He wanted that in His Scriptures. Even those things that offend you are the things breathed out by God. and He wanted those in His Scriptures. They're meant to be there by the work of God Himself. That means... That means there's no part of Scripture that we're allowed to skip. There's no part of Scripture we're allowed to devalue. We're not, we're not allowed to devalue a single line in it. All of it is of God. We cannot say that's too hard. We cannot say that's too boring or that's too controversial. All of it is for us to have and for a reason, and it is the preacher's job to show what that is and be diligent in that work. And so it's God-breathed, meaning that it comes from the very mouth of God. This Bible of ours is divinely inspired from Him. He spoke through men as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Hebrews says no prophecy has its origin, or sorry, 2 Peter, has no, no prophecy has its origin in man. It's all of God. So as we have always said, if you want to hear the voice of God audibly, read the Bible out loud. He speaks to us primarily through His Word. And so it's no, it's no surprise that as we become more biblically illiterate in North America, and we really are, the, the stats are terrible, as we become more biblically illiterate and don't know our Bibles and don't read them, our understanding of what God has said, His will, all those things, that we are so confused as to what God has said. And what is useful here, therefore, if it is breathed out, if all Scripture is useful, therefore, it says it's useful for what? Rebuking, putting us in our place when we sin, disciplining us as children. It's good for correcting, bringing us out of the error of thought and life, training up in righteousness, showing us what is good and right and true and how to walk in it, how Jesus is our one true righteousness. And why? So that the servant of God may be fully equipped. Fully equipped. If we want to be fully equipped, then we need to be in the Word. If we want to know the will of God, we need to be in the Word. If we want to know how to live for Jesus, we need to be in the Word. If we want to know how to be effective evangelists, we need to be in the Word. If we want to be good fathers and mothers, children, then we are to be in the Word. If you want to know whether your church is being faithful, be in the Word, fully equipped. What does the church need? Preachers to preach the Word. Not our own thoughts and feelings, but God's thoughts, God's truth, God's commands. Jesus said in the Great Commission, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I have commanded. So we have a biblical example of expository preaching. We have the knowledge that all Scripture is God-breathed, useful for building up the body. And this brings us to our next point, the command to preach the Word. And I know we've kind of gone over that again, but let me show you a specific part that is incredible. 2 Timothy 4, Paul is writing to young Timothy, a young, new pastor, preacher, He's been put in charge of the church and a young pastor and, and he's sitting there and Paul commissions him 
And he says something that shows us what a preacher is commissioned to do, what a pastor is commissioned to do. He says this in 2 Timothy 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the word, young Timothy. He just finished telling him that all scriptures God breathed. And then he says here, in the presence of God, who will judge us, I commission you, preach the word. That is his commission before God. Something every preacher will be judged on one day is whether we will preach the word. Did you preach the word accurately, faithfully, not man's ideas, not culture's thoughts. Did you preach the word and the whole word? And so you, you know what he, he says next to Timothy, and, and we just usually stop there, but if we can go forward, I'll show you what he says next. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. There will be those, and oh boy are we here now, where people are turning away from sound doctrine, sound teaching. Their ears itch for what they want to hear, not what God says. They're going to find the church, they're going to find the place where they just, they want to hear something specific. They want the preacher to say what they're passionate about, not humbly saying, God, what do you want me to hear? What they want is what they want, but what they need is what God says. They don't want to humble themselves before God to receive the word. They want to be consumers of what is exciting and trendy, and they'll turn from listening to faithful teaching, true teaching, Bible teaching, they'll wander off into myths. It says, hey, did you hear what that guy on YouTube said about the Bible code and that Bible prophecy? Hey, did you hear God is a God of all love and no wrath? Talked about that today. Hey, did you hear God loves you just the way you are and doesn't want to change a thing? Hey, did you hear that God wants you to make you rich and famous and never allow you to suffer ever? Itching ears. We know we have itching ears when we open the word of God and our response is, this passage doesn't excite me today. It's not my current interest. Really? Are we not interested in what God has to say to you in his word? The holy God who created all things and knows every detail of your life because he created you, has privileged you with his word and you're not interested. We must have we must be in a place where we walk through Scripture and we must let God speak to us. We must come expecting Him to speak to us as we open His Word. It's all good for every moment, every person of every time. Timothy, I commission you, preach the Word faithfully and fully and keep doing it even when people turn their ears away from the truth, even when your church shrinks because of it. Be ready in season and out of season. That means when it's trendy and when it's not. I know your temptation will be to make your sermons more relevant, more trendy, more liked, but don't do it, Timothy. Preach the word, even when it becomes unpopular to do so. In season, out of season. Even when it becomes boring to people with other passions. Even when your culture has wandered off and says, I'll never set foot in a church. They just preach about God's word. That's just boring stuff. That doesn't match me at all. Keep doing it. Preach the word, Timothy. Now, we need to be clear. We need to be concise. We need to not be dry. This is passionate stuff here. But keep preaching the word. Next point, preach the whole counsel of God. Why do we preach through the whole book of a Bible as a church? Why do we go through 50 chapters of Genesis and take over a year to do it? Why do we sometimes go line by line, chapter by chapter, because we are to preach the whole counsel of God? In Acts 20, 26 to 27, we see Paul say to the elders in Jerusalem, 
Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So to the preacher who does not teach the whole counsel of God, the whole truth, there is blood on his hands. Paul says, I'm free from the blood of all because I did not shrink from declaring all of it to you, all of God's counsel. In the same way, the preacher needs to declare all of God's truth. So again, we do not skip. We try and cover it as fully as we can. Why? Because it's all valuable, it's all God-breathed, and so that we can say with a good conscience that everything has been heard. God's judgment, God's salvation, God's commands, all of it. We can't have Christians walking around ignorant of what God says. We have to teach it all. So walking through line by line, chapter by chapter, helps us to thoroughly teach. We cannot have people being condemned to hell because we don't speak about hell. And we can't be in a place where we have some Christians being devoured by wolves and false teachers because we did not teach and equip them with the truth of God's Word. For what is it that Paul says next to this Jerusalem eldership? He starts by saying, I'm innocent of the blood because I've taught you the whole counsel of God. And then he says this, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after me and my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. That's serious. From among your own selves will come up from within you those who will twist the word of God and draw disciples away after them. Right now, From among the church, there are wolves trying to pull you and I away from Christ and sound doctrine by twisting the Word of God. Almost every single New Testament uh, book of the Bible speaks about false teaching. God knew this was going to be a major issue, and it sounds like the Word, but it is twisted version of the Word when when they talk. It's meant to draw you to them and not to God. So preachers must preach the whole counsel of God so that souls may be saved and preserved until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Preach the whole counsel. Why? So that people don't get stolen away by wolves and eaten, and that blood is therefore on your hands. So that's why we go through, chapter by chapter, sometimes line by line, trying to bring the full counsel of God forward. And the next point, the power of God in His Word. We preach the Word of God in context expositorily because we know that the true power to change us is not in man's words or in man's ideas, but in God and God's truth. Jesus, during his high priestly prayer, said this, sanctify them, meaning transform them into the likeness of him, make them holy, sanctify them in your truth. And then he said, your word is truth. It is his word that does the work in us. Timothy 3.15 says the word makes us wise to salvation. Romans 10.17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. There is power in the word of God because he uses it for his ends. And listen to this, Isaiah 55.10-11. This is probably the best one yet. Isaiah 55.10-11 is the real powerful statement here about how God uses his words to transform and change us and to the power and effect that he purposes. He says this, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. That's awesome. We see over and over again this picture that just like rain comes down and causes the fields to grow, God's word comes down and it causes us to grow. And it works in us in that way. And he says, it will succeed in the things by which I sent it to do. That's an incredible good promise. We see over and over again that the word of God is sent to accomplish, to transform people. The point is the power is not in a great illustration, 
a great story, a clever word, a well-positioned title. The power is in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit takes His Word that He has authored and He applies it to the heart and mind of us supernaturally. That's what He does. And He changes us from the inside out. That is why we expository preach. We see from Scripture that it changes lives. And to this end, I thought I would also direct you to 1 Corinthians 1.17 where Paul says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And then he says this, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. <laughs> it's not the eloquent words of my words or the great human wisdom that is the power, Paul says. It's not a well-placed title or an expert in oratory ability that may excite the flesh for a time, but not for eternal change. It is the plain, clear teaching of the gospel, and it is the power of the cross working in sinners through his word. That is where the power of God is to change us. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The power is in God acting through His Word, period. I've said it before, I have nothing to offer you. I have nothing to offer you as a leader. My life is relatively boring. I don't have anything to offer you. But I have been given um, the the wonderful uh, privilege to come here every week and to give you the Word of God, and I have to do that as faithfully as I can. And I believe that is the power that changes us and grows us and transforms us and even comes against us when we need that. Finally, our last point. Man does not live on bread alone. Why do we preach the Word of God in its context? according to its shape, form, and meaning, and not man's thoughts. Deuteronomy 8.3, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Folks, it's not about the written word. It's about the written word taking us supernaturally to the living word, Jesus Christ. And he is life. He is life for the sinner who is dead in his trespasses and sins. He is life for the suffering and the hurting. He is life for the confused and the deceived. The Word of God kills sin in our life that is killing us. And so the Word of God is a lamp to our feet that shows us the path that we don't stumble and fall into a pit. More than all of that, the Word of God is the loving, authoritative, inerrant, glorious words of our God who we love and who has shown in it that he loves us. You can have all the bread in the world, all the money in the world, all the physical things your body could ever need, but you don't live on bread alone. You don't live on bread alone. There's a time during one of the big economic crashes where guys were jumping out of skyscrapers because they lost all their money. You don't live on bread alone. You also have a soul. That soul needs to be fed and given life as well. The scriptures make us wise for salvation. We need to be pointed to the one who gives life, Jesus Christ. We need to know the God who breathed life into us. We need to have the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts and minds and to save us from our sins. And all for this purpose, that we may have God to have all your life and all our souls, all our being, finding its rest in Him. That's why we do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He is the giver of life. So why do we preach expositorily? So that you may have God, the one who has, as Jeremiah says, loved you with an everlasting love. That's why we give the word of God. That's why we have to bring that so I end with this. Is expository preaching the only form of preaching? No, it's not. 
But do we believe that it is the most faithful form of preaching? Yes. Because Scripture demonstrates that for us. That the principles of Scripture show us that that is the way that we should be preaching. That for that reason, expository preaching will be our most regular, normative diet here as a church. We can do like we're doing today from time to time. Little, um, uh, little topical messages. And throughout the summer, we're going to do a lot more of that. But we'll always encourage and return to the expository method as a faithful biblical method. This is a distinctive of our church. And I'm grateful that it's a distinctive of our church. May God help all who teach in this pulpit to rightfully handle the word of God and to preach the word of God. I want to end with just a repeat of our quote from David Helm on expository preaching with an addition at the end. Expository preaching is empowered preaching that rightfully submits the shape and emphasis of the sermon to the shape and emphasis of a biblical text. In that way, it brings out the text, brings out of the text what the Holy Spirit put there. I love that. If you go to another church, make sure they're preaching the word. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.